Yeah, that's good. Yep. Good morning. Does that sound? That doesn't sound very loud. You think Grace didn't didn't turn that on again for us? Better hold my breath. I don't have my mask on. <laughs> All right. What's going on here? Check, check, check. All right. Check, 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 check. Sound okay? Is that too loud? How's that? Is that a little better? Check, check, check. All right. It's amazing what happens when you plug something in. I don't have a whole lot of announcements this morning. Um, obviously, Sunday school is on, and we've got a couple of Sunday school kids, so that's all good. Um, we are working on the annual reports. I think I have just about every report in, except for mine. And so anyways, here I am telling everybody to get a report in, and then <laughs> I guess I better get my button gear. Um, and then I think we're going to see what the session says, but probably have an annual meeting probably in March sometime for that. Um, the optimism place stuff there, I, I've been trying to get a hold of them um, and get that out. So, and uh, I don't know, it just seems that the pandemic is really hard to get hold of people for some reason. So it may be the woman's on vacation, I don't know. But anyways, we're working on getting that stuff out. So, um, so if you see it back there, um, <laughs> we haven't forgot about it. We're still working on that. Um, yeah, that's about all I had. Like for announcements, anything I'm missing? Okay. Let's take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us sing and pray in God's presence. For God has created the world and called it good. In Christ, God has redeemed the world and defeated the powers of death. The Holy Spirit is at work in the world, calling us to follow Jesus. Please join me in a word of prayer. God, ever creating, ever loving, ever leading, your presence is peace when we are frantic. Your word is truth when we face deception. Your spirit offers freedom when we are paralyzed by fear. You give purpose in confusing times. You call for justice when the world settles for inequality. For all that you are and all that you have been and all that you will be, we worship you as a source of life. The promise of redemption and the spirit of love and action, one God, now and always. Come, let us worship God. I want to start off Holy, holy, holy. I remember as a kid, we, they sang this every Sunday. I, did they do that here at Atwood Presbyterian? And uh, every Sunday. And I remember um, I was at, uh, I, I think it was a youth group, and the minister asked, how do we start church? And I said, well, holy, holy, holy. And he laughed because we hadn't sang that in about five years. That was one of the things he had changed, but it was just so ingrained. Anyways, there is something beautiful about this, uh, this hymn. So let's uh, have Ralph play, and we will listen to the words of Holy, Holy, Holy.
just going to change the screen here. Trying to get this whole camera system figured out. Did anybody notice that the pens nowadays have these little plastic tips on them? And I remember when I got my first one, what in the world is that about? Sometimes they're on the, this is on the ink end and sometimes they're on the other end, but they're really nice for hitting your phone. You know, my, my big fingers, they, anyways, yeah, just, so any t you know, next time you see a pen, pay attention, maybe it's got one of those things. So anyways, that's what I'm using up here. So anyways, our children's story. I've got a request. Last week, if you remember, I gave a bag and um, I'm hoping you got something there for me. All right, let's see the bag. So this is a mystery bag. I have no idea what's in here. And uh, so anyways, our girls back here, they put something in here. And we're supposed to look at this and try and figure out a children's story from this. And uh, we'll see what's in here. Oh, feel something. Right, what's our first thing? Oh, looks like a candle. All right, we've got a candle. Let's see if we can set it up there. Candle, what else have we got? You know what's in there, don't you? A key. Well, look at that, it's a key. All right. Boy, this is going to be a hard children's story to come up with a candle and a key. What else is in here? Oh, we got one thing. It's in my hand. What could it be? You said it, didn't you? What is it? Oh, it's, an, it's a little angel and a little, uh, it's maybe a little hard for everybody to see, but a little angel and a, and a little piece of glass or maybe epoxy. Isn't that something? All right. So what can we make with this. Do you think of any Bible stories that you can kind of remember? There's a one um, Bible story. It's, it's Jesus standing at a door. It's a famous painting. And Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking and he wants us in. And you know, what do you usually use? You use a key to enter the door, don't you? Yeah. But the problem with this door picture of Jesus is there's no door handle, there's no keyhole on it. And so, if you look at that, it means whoever's on the inside has to open the door. So when, it, you know, it represents when Jesus knocks on our heart, the key for us to let Jesus in was we have to say, yes, Jesus, I accept you, I want you to come into my life. But what is Jesus? He's the light of the world, isn't he? Isn't that in scriptures? The light of the world, like a candle? And that he brings us peace and joy to the world? Okay, I think that one's good. Now, what about the angel? Hmm. I don't know. You guys got some ideas back there? You're going to say something. Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> Angels keep you safe. Hmm. Yeah. God sends amazing things to us in life to keep us safe. And I know as a minister, I've been told stories of guardian angels that come and help someone. And they're positive that Jesus sent someone to help them in their time of need. I've heard so many stories like that. But you know, sometimes you can be a guardian angel for someone. Someone that's in a, having a tough time. And just say, Edith, you look a little sad today. What's up? And you know, you can be a guardian angel for someone too. To help them in their time. You sit and you listen, you chat with your friend and talk about things. And so that's something very beautiful too that, you know, we have guardian angels that come to us. And I know I've experienced that. I'm positive that someone prayed for me and something happened in my life. But I had a guardian angel. But you know, you can be a guardian angel too. Well, those are wonderful things that make me think about the Bible. 
You know, the key of Jesus to letting Jesus in your heart is that we have to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I want you in my heart. And what is Jesus? He's the light of the world. He brings light and peace to the world. And that, you know, we have these guardian angels in our life, and we can be a guardian angel. Oh, I love these ones. So I'm going to give this back to you. I'm going to give this to Edith. You're going to be promised you'll be here next Sunday. And I want to see three things in there that we can make a children's story from. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Give your stuff back. There you go. So we're going to end it with a prayer. And um, something that kind of dawned on me in, in, this, in the Sunday school teachers is the children don't hear the Lord's Prayer in church because they go down to Sunday school. So I thought we would move the Lord's Prayer up to children's time and that, you know, we can say the Lord's Prayer and the children can experience that. When we come to community and listen and, and, and pray in unison, there's something very powerful about that. Uh, dear Lord, um, we're so thankful that uh, you can come into our heart and that we accept you into our heart. And dear Lord, we're so thankful that you are the light of the world. You dispel the darkness in the world that can, uh, you know, weigh us down at times. And dear Lord, know that we can be helpful angels in this world, that we can help others. And dear Lord, we, we remember all these things and we, and we remember you when we repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go to Sunday school. That's just too cute, isn't it? <laughs> well, let's offer up a word of prayer to God for understanding for the scriptures that we're about to read. Let's pray. God of light and life, we turn to your word for guidance and inspiration week after week. Send your Holy Spirit to move in among us this day as we listen to the scriptures read and interpreted. Help us hear your challenge and your promise and to respond with our commitment to follow Jesus, your living word. Amen. So I have um, three scripture readings and the first one's Isaiah. And so in this one, it, it's very interesting. For some reason, they left out verse seven and eight. And yeah, verse seven and eight to me strike me as a very important part of the scripture lesson. So these are lectionary readings. They're kind of readings set down by the church. Um, but verse 7 and 8, in there, you know, Isaiah says, Here I am, Lord, send me, when he hears this call from God, send me out into the world, I will be your voice. And so Isaiah, at this point in time, the, uh, um, they had a great king die, but everything seems to be kind of falling apart. And so um, God is calling Isaiah to voice the concerns to the world. So let's uh, turn to the word of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings that covered their faces, and two they covered their feet, and two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, and then he had taken from the tongs with the altar. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitation, until the houses are left deserted, the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. And as is terabith and the oak leaves stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Amen. Psalm 138. I'm reading an excerpt here. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart before the gods. I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that I surpass your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear that what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great, though the Lord is exalted. He looks kindly on the lowly, through, though lofty. He sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes, and with your right hand you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Amen. And then we turn to Luke 5. And so Luke 5, this is the calling of Jesus' disciples. Uh, he's, he's calling Simon. And it's interesting, he's just referring to Simon in the scripture, but there are other disciples that are called as well. And, um, and one thing I'll just kind of dive into in the sermon a little bit. Um, this is not Simon's first encounter with Jesus. Simon has, in previous to this, uh, witnessed Jesus' healing, witnessed um, the demons saying that this is the Messiah come. And um, yeah, and uh, the other thing is, I think this is a, actually quite a successful little business. They've got a couple of boats, they've got partners. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, Simon's doing very well in life and he sets this aside to follow Jesus. So let's turn to God's word. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, uh, Lake Gennesaret is the same as Lake Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. They're all one and the same. The people were crowding around him, listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let the, down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they piled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed Jesus. Amen. It was the year King Uzziah died, or 
or maybe it was the last year the Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup, or maybe it was the year 9-11 that rattled the world, or it was the year that the COVID pandemic began. Whatever event we fill in there, it was the year when things fell apart and when the foundations were shaken, when our lives were disrupted, when all that had once been familiar and good and, and, and yeah, it it's now seems long ago and far away. It was the year King Uzziah died. It was a bad time. It was a time of anxiety, a time of unknowns. And Isaiah finds himself in the middle of it. Remember last week's sermon, we talked about, you know, all those good things in life. They're, they're over on this side, and then we have, you know, the, the bad things in life that are over here, and, you know, we get pulled back and forth between the two, but quite often we're in the middle, and we have to remember that Jesus was there, God himself. You know, this is a great example of that. So we have Isaiah. It's the same as you and I today in today's world. You know, we're preoccupied with the news and events and, you know, what's going on. And, you know, we're seeing the dark side and we really want a message from God. But you can see we have the dark side of the world over here that Isaiah is looking at. And then he has a vision of what the world could be over here, what God has in mind for us. And there is Uzziah, or Isaiah in the middle. And... He's there. But the importance of this story is, of Isaiah and his people is that they had a focus of life that wasn't really great until Isaiah has seen God in heaven. A son of Isaiah found that his pre preconceived notions of the world had to change and his priorities had to be realigned with God's kingdom. And he had to tell everybody. And you know what his response to that is? He said, God, here I am. Send me. Isn't it interesting in the scripture that it was the year King Uzziah died? But once Isaiah sees God in heaven over here, that majestic uh, scene that we read in the scriptures, we don't hear about the earthly king anymore. New things have now literally come to light. New needs have been discovered. New priorities have been set by God. You ever think about that? Isn't that why we come to worship on a Sunday? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about worshiping God, but it's also about hearing God's voice revealed in the scriptures. And when we hear that voice, it allows new things to emerge in our thinking, new ideas to be discovered, new priorities to emerge. We don't come to worship just to have our needs met, but to find out just what our needs really are what our needs are, what the world's needs are, and to encounter God in ways that makes us into the kind of people that God wants us to be. To be so moved like Isaiah, to say, here I am, Lord, send me. I want to make a difference. I remember many years ago, um, sitting in church down in Moncton, just a regular Sunday, and, uh, and I remember the minister it was Catherine Campbell. I'm pretty sure you remember Catherine. I'm sure she preached here a lot. She was a great minister. And uh, so anyways, she was looking after our church. We were without a minister. And I think your church was without a minister at the same time. So she was doing kind of double duty there. But anyway, she was down there. And I really have no idea what she preached, what the scripture lesson was. But I do remember at the end of the service, she came in with one of those big roasting pans. Like, you know, probably like a turkey would fit in it, kind of size pan. The two handles on the end, kind of stainless steel, this great big pan. And she set it down on the communion table up front. And, um, and, and if you remember Catherine, um, she said, I want that filled by next Sunday. But if you remember Catherine, it wasn't a, a suggestion. You were told, and I'm seeing some smiles here. You know she was a very forceful person. You're doing this whether you want to or not. Get that pan filled. And I remember sitting there in the pews and I'm thinking, really? I'm kind of looking around, you know, there's really not that many people here this Sunday to hear this command and that's a mighty pig pot up there. But I went home 
And I gathered up my little handful of change, and, and I think my boys did too. I think they each went to their piggy banks and got some change. And, you know, we came and we added our little token offering to the pot. But was I amazed? At the end of watching that pot getting filled, that pot was literally heaped up. It was, it was overflowing. Like, it, it was just astounding. And I remember watching two of my friends, two big burly men, two hands in each end of that pot carrying that thing out of church to be counted. Just amazing. If it had not been for worship and been challenged by the word of God, been challenged by a minister about my perceptions of the world, I would not have made a donation. Our church would not have made a difference in someone's life. I would never have been seen or had witnessed the abundance of working together, what that can accomplish. I would not have been a witness to Jesus at work in the world, Jesus doing amazing things in our lives. Simon Peter, and I'm just going to call him Simon just to keep it simple, had been watching the abundant haul of fish. But something happened in his heart. Something changed him with this encounter with Jesus at this point in time. Simon had a glimpse of something far greater than himself. He had a glimpse of the kingdom of God. You know, this was not Simon's first encounter with Jesus. Scripture tells us that Simon and Jesus met earlier. Jesus was at Simon's house. His mother-in-law really needed some healing, and Jesus healed her. And then he spends the evening healing and performing miracles on others, exercising demons. And, you know, there's a lot of people brought. He witnessed all this. He witnessed it all. And he even hears the demons yell at Jesus, you are the Messiah. So when Jesus asks him to use his boat in order to hear better by the crowds, Simon has already gotten to know who Jesus is. He knows the truth. And when Jesus tells Simon to take his fishing crew out into the deep, he does question, you know, we do hear that. Uh, really, Jesus, I'm the fishing expert here. We've been doing this all night. And, you know, you can see him thinking, you are a carpenter. What do you know about fishing? But he does decide to do it. They go into the deep. The deep is a metaphor for taking a risk. Jesus is pushing Simon's boundaries. Leave the shallows, waters, Simon. Go into the deep, Simon. Have you ever taken a risk yourself? Taken a, a huge risk? Think about that moment. Have you been disappointed? Maybe yes. Have you been successful and rewarded? Maybe yes. Simon knew he was looking at Jesus, God himself, in the eyes. And Jesus was calling Simon to risk being disappointed in God. My story of the minister, of Catherine, and her roasting pan is an example of risk-taking. What would Catherine have done if she came the next Sunday and there was that pan there and it was empty? She took a risk. Simon finds himself surrounded by God's love and goodness. He knows the truth, that he needs to change his view of the world. Have you ever noticed how often we use our power for ourselves? Simon started off by trying to tell Jesus what to do. Um, no, Jesus, that won't work. But, you know, Simon represents our, our human side of things in this telling Jesus that's not possible, we have tried that, it doesn't work. But Jesus, the embodiment of goodness, grace, love, and everything that's good and beautiful in life, tells Simon, no, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it my way. Simon, the disciples, become people who help others know how they've been overwhelmed by God's powerful goodness and love, his abundance. We have a saying that kind of embodies this teaching of Jesus. You know, the saying that Jesus said, make you fishers of men, to change people's lives and to see God at work in the world and then turn witness, and in turn witness those people go out and make a difference themselves. 
The same thing I'm thinking about is, you know, you give a man a fish and he eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Came across this quote by Trevor Noah. I have no clue who Trevor Noah is, but it's a great quote. He has a little different take on this. People love to say, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and, and he'll eat for a lifetime. But they don't say, wouldn't it be nice if you actually gave that man a fishing rod? That's the part of the analogy that's missing. I like that. It makes you pause and think. Give people the tools that they need. God is at work in the world, and often right under our noses, and we do not even realize he's at work. I'm going to show a, a video clip shortly. It's a video clip from Kenya. It's about all these things we've been talking about, seeing God at work in the world, taking risks, responding to God's call, helping people, motivating others to help. I'm going to show this video and then we'll talk about it. Just wanted to make sure you noticed that Gay Lee right there. Which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. How do we get out of this? Okay. Now, we've got a bunch of dairy guys here. Seven liters per cow. Would that cut the bill today? 
No. I remember my, my grandfather, and this has got to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he's been dead a while, but my cousin was a dairy farmer, and he, my grandfather's going about this cow, and he had produced 100 pounds of milk, and I'm sure that's actually kind of low nowadays, I'm sure there's cows that exceed that. That's 45 liters of milk, and they're talking about seven. So, you know, I, I just found that very interesting, that there is a lot of potential there. But where I want to go with this, this is a, a, actually starts off as a love story how we got to this point. And so here is, is our couple, and uh, Tara and Wesley Carrer, I, I think, hope I pronounced their last name correctly. But their story is fascinating. Tara grew up in Elmira, just, just down the road. Um, I, if I understand right, I think her father taught at high school in Listowel, um, Blair uh, McKay. I did not know him as a high school teacher, but anyways, that's what I understand. And so there's a, a lot of connections to this area. And so anyways, um, they're both very gifted athletes. And so they got scholarships to go down to the United States. And so Wesley is obviously is from uh, Kenya, and um, Tara's from uh, Elmira, and that's how they met, a university down in the States, and they were both runners. Um, Wesley is a very gifted runner. He's won many marathons. And uh, the one marathon in particular is he won um, the Boston Marathon, I believe it was in 2012. And so, but how Wesley got there is uh, the story about sharing and abundance that I want to share with you. He was a very gifted student. But in Kenya, you have to pay for your education. You have to pay for your high school. He was from a very poor family, many kids. He could not afford to go to college or, or to um, high school. But through the generosity of a Catholic priest that lived nearby, knew Wesley, seen his gifts and his ability, he paid for Wesley to go to high school. And Wesley excelled in school, and he got a scholarship to go run in the United States. That's how him and Tara met. So Wesley decided he wanted to give this money back to this Catholic priest, and, and he took some of the winnings he had from the, these marathons. And the Catholic priest says, no, you go help someone else. As a couple, they took this very seriously. They decided they were going to help other kids. They are going to help their area. And so they started this Kenya uh, Foundation that um, is part of that dairy cooperative that I was talking about. And, we're, and this is where you get all these tanglements of this local connection. Um, I actually met Tara about eight years ago, and uh, I invited her to the Millerton Presbyterian Church. I was doing some ministry work down there at that time. And um, she wrote a book to raise money for funds for this charity. I had her in, and she sold her books and told us her story. It, it was beautiful. And uh, so that was one kind of entanglement. And then... Uh, my cousin retired from dairy farming a few years ago, and I, had, I don't talk to him all that much. And said, what, what have you been doing? And he says, oh, I, I, got, I went over to Kenya, and I was um, teaching them how to milk cows, how to feed them, and all that good stuff. And so anyways, I hadn't realized the time, but it was this organization. And then I uh, was curious, and I started looking down the list of people working there. The treasurer is Tracy Mann from Moncton. I don't know if you know Bill Mann. He was a dairy farmer for a lot of years. Anyways, another little connection. And, uh, and we have some people in this church that have worked on this. They know all about this. And so, anyways, it just, I just found this rather, rather fascinating. So here we are. We have this amazing story of helping others. And, uh, oh, the other little part, I was thinking, I had one more thing I was going to say. I was at a party with some friends, and so I, there was a dairy farmer friend there, and this was a number of years ago, and he had this story, he was talking about how they were sourcing bulk coolers to send to Africa, and I had no clue that he was talking about this particular project. I just thought, well, that's pretty cool. And uh, so anyways, yeah, they, they sourced them, and so they... The bulk coolers that we've seen in that video came from this area. Again, fascinating. And then the other little connection is that uh, Gailey, um, 
great cooperative, very, very community oriented, and they were giving back. And so they, uh, they have a fund and they provide the seed money for this dairy cooperative. It's just fascinating how this all came together. But this is where I was talking about this fishing pole story. A fishing pole that you were giving to these people to help lift them up. A fishing pole, a group of people that needed a hand up and not a hand out. Jesus told Simon in his fear, his fear of leaving his business behind, taking a risk, doing so for the glory of God, don't be afraid. Some people don't catch fish because they refuse to go into deep water. Jesus told Simon, let's leave the shallows, let's leave the comfort of our lives, and let's go into the deep. Let's take, a, let's take a risk there. And when was the last time you took a risk? When was the last time you took a risk for Jesus or for God's kingdom? When was the last time this church took a risk? We have taken risks. I would say our drive-in services, that was a risk. We didn't know what was going to happen. We do other things. We do take risks. We step out of our comfort zone and we respond like Simon did to the, the abundance that God has given us. So that's my challenge. Do some internal looking this week. When have you taken a risk? What has that risk been? For Jesus. Maybe it's picking up the phone. Maybe it's talking to someone you haven't talked to in a while. Someone Maybe a relationship is broken. Or maybe it's just something you want to talk to, you haven't talked to in a long time. Take a risk. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're so astounded by the abundance we have in this world, and we know it comes through you, your grace, your love, your, your deep love for us. And how do we respond, dear Lord? We respond by taking risks, stepping out of our comfort zones, taking a risk for you to glorify your name both here and forevermore. Amen. Well, Rolf, I think this is a very appropriate piece of music for this. Will you come and follow me as a follow-up to that sermon? Thanks, Rolf. Partnerships and service, that's what we do to take our gifts into places of deep need around the world and even in our own country. And with God's blessings, our, our offerings of our time, our, our wealth, our material things, they do make a difference, touching lives with God's love and mercy in Jesus' name. Let's receive the offering.
what a surprising generosity. Jesus encouraged his disciples to keep fishing when they thought their nets were empty. Encourage us. Encourage us to keep giving when needs seem overwhelming and resources scarce. We entrust our gifts to you with the faith that you can surprise us, you can surprise others through all that we can accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join our hearts and our all together and pray our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession before God. God of grace and compassion, we bring before you the widening circles of our lives. We lift up those closest and dearest to us, and we name them before you with great affection, great gratitude, and a moment of silence. Thank you that your love reaches into the very depths of their needs. That your love gives them strength for their journeys. Jesus, we are here for them, and we are here for you. Lord Jesus, we celebrate the life of your church, this church, the intentional and the international community of believers whose worship and service strengthen our faith and challenge us to live what we believe. We give thanks for people of vision, people of courage, people of compassion that surround us. In the midst of sudden and overwhelming crises, which cry out for response throughout the world, you work through the church to act swiftly with mercy and hope. We give you thanks for all that has been done in Haiti, Af Afghanistan, and other places. And for the long-term commitment we show to you, to those in deepest need. Jesus, we are here for them, and we are here for you. Spirit of healing and hope, we remember before you the many communities and individuals experiencing ongoing conflict and violence. Issues of climate change, whether it's widespread drought or severe flooding, crowded quarters and refugee compounds, a yearning for education, a struggle for freedom. We join our prayers with those of desperate people any, everywhere, trusting in your gifts of courage and resilience to, to grapple with these steep challenges in a world of so much abundance. Inspire generosity and hope among those who give and those who receive. Jesus, we are here for them Jesus, we are here for you. Holy and loving God, we stand in awe of your goodness. We know in our hearts the tug of our common humanity, as well as the boldness of your spirit to respond to those who suffer and make a difference wherever we can. We offer these prayers and the unspoken prayers of our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, Rolf's got a surprise for us. I am not 100% sure what he's going to play, but he's, he's got something up his sleeve. And I'm seeing a book on the piano, so my intuition is telling me you're going to play the piano.
Thank you so much for that roll. That was perfect. And again, a good way to end our church service. We come to that time. It's say adieu. Go out into the world. We can go with uh, the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.